This is Russ McClay, and this is the inaugural podcast for Dow Lodge Podcasts. And uh, in this first episode, which is kind of a disaster in some ways because of my interview abilities, um, we have a chat with my good friend Nick Parks. And uh, this was conducted over uh, telephone via Skype. Uh, Nick Parks is uh, somebody that introduced me to a lot of uh, interesting things when I was a young lad, uh, one of them being the Arantia book and also pretty much the whole spectrum of Eastern religion, and yoga, meditation, diet, um, and has been a tremendous influence on my life. And in this uh, interview, we basically, it's just rambling, uh, and it was very late here, so I had had a few brewskis, and it sounds like it. <laughs> and Nick, uh, who's on the other side of the world, actually, uh, in North America, uh, it was early morning for him, so he was having his coffee and sounding very coherent. So uh, uh, kind of made for an interesting uh, session for, for both of us. And we... Probably we'll do another one, and I'll try to I'll try to learn from this first endeavor. So, uh, this is uh, Nick Parks and myself uh, having a chat and uh, attempting to do a podcast for posterity, so to speak. Hello, Nick. Hey. Hey. <laughs> Yeah, I'll have you know that this is the inaugural uh, podcast of Dow Lodge. This may be the first and last, but it's something I've been wanting to, wanted to do. Yeah, some of these guys have some great podcasts. I, 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 I was introduced to this guy that does a Zen uh, broad, uh, podcast. That, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's an incredible guy. He's really, I think he lives in Berkeley or something, but he's, he's full of a lot of everyday humor like we are. But he's also spent quite a bit of time. Uh, All right. Well, we don't want to get we don't want to get too far out here. I just want to say that this is my inaugural. This is something I've been planning for a number of years, and I've got a couple of mentors, and um, and yeah. yeah, this is we're going to try this out. This is one of my good ones. So that that question I posed. Do you, do you have any kind of like short like uh, uh, yeah. retort, retort to that? <laughs> uh, what what is the Arantia book selling? I mean, do you have something on that? Oh, that one. Yeah. 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 Okay. It's selling the book, and they want you to send them money. That's no, oh, come on. No, 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 no. I mean, what is the... <laughs> Oh, sure. That's certainly what it seems to be about. They want to get more of the... They want to get more books on the planet because... Oh, oh wait a minute. There's more the... languages in before everything sort of takes a hike on another level, you know? And, uh, and, I, and, I, and I applaud that because the book is... Uh, the more that they can get that book out there, the more that someone will stumble upon it. And so it's a very important business that they're up to. But also, uh, I, as a footnote, Are you I, I'm not too... Are you serious? They're, they want to sell books? There's well, that's no their whole... That, your Rancher Foundation, that's their that's their, their job, you know. No, you no, get no, no. Okay, okay, wait a minute. The question, you're not... I don't... Maybe the question is not quite clear. Let's say, what what are the <laughs> what are the revealators selling? You know, you know... The revelators. What, well, yeah, I mean, like, okay, look, you know, forget about the Ranch Foundation. I mean... I'm saying so big okay. book sales. <laughs> well, okay. One, my answer might be my answer might be. Um, uh, well, I think I think they're trying to sell the the. I think they're trying to sell that there is a relationship with God that's extraordinary, and it's a lot more extraordinary God than anything you've heard about so far. Okay, that's okay. what I think. Okay, that that's that's uh, yeah, that's the kind of answer I was thinking about. Point of view, the Arantia book really kicks out. It's like a nuclear bomb. The Christians have. I mean, the Christians are so far out. Some of them. That they actually think they're going to rise up to a place, and they probably will. Where they had the everybody there has got the Bible under their arm, and they do nothing but talk from the Bible. Yeah, mm. and there's a vast majority of Christians who are pretty hooked on that. Yeah, and and I think that like like Jesus when Jesus was asked by Gannon what what he thought about Buddha, I think that's what's going to happen to the Chuck Smith people. That they're going to rise up to where Chuck Smith is, and they're going to spend the next maybe three or four centuries there until they of their own free volition find another way. But the universe is not at all about forcing you to awaken, you know. And and it's very absolutely, interesting. yeah. It's, it's very interesting when you, like, I go to this Christian church with my buddies, you know, 
every once in a while. I go about six times a year. But, I mean, and I've sat up the hills with them. I think I told you the story before. And they're looking up in the sky going, yep, it's only 4,000 years old. <laughs> it's like, oh, my God. Really? You, but you on know, the other hand, they're no, great honestly, guys. Honestly, wait a minute. Hold on a second now. We have to have a little dialogue <laughs> here. You you honestly know people that uh, that think the world is only uh, 4,000 years old. 4,004, they'll tell you. Yeah. Really? Oh, yeah. And, they're, and, they're, I mean, and guys seriously. I've hung out with for a long time, and I've, and I've been like at retreats with them, and we've, we've done studies together, and we've, you know, we've been participated in meals together and talked, but at the same time, they'll, they'll take you right out in the yard and look up and go, yeah, and we're all looking at the stars, because we're, we're up, we're like about 6,000 feet up in the air, and we, we've been fed and treated like gods, and so, it, 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 and the guys, the, the certain group of us guys like to go out and look at the stars, you know, but it's nothing for them to think that this is all true, you know, and I, and I thought, I think to myself, this is so fucking cool. And I don't say But anything. I mean, I, are, I, are they, I mean, it seems um, almost, almost <laughs> unbelievable like, because, I mean, how could you be that insulated from, you know, just basic science? I mean, how can you just like dismiss? At, at, uh, at one point, I thought, I'll I mean, how, how, well, wait, I mean, it's, it seems like it has to be an extremely either uneducated or truly ignorant person that could really, uh, you well, know. I think you know this. Uh, Chuck's church in the beginning was all a bunch of rehab drug drug people, you know, people that were coming out of the drug world and, and found a place in Christianity, you know. Yeah, so but that was that thought, was before all... the that was before the internet, though. This is back in the tent days, right? But on the other hand, that's what I thought about these people because I've spent quite a bit of time around them. I've been on three retreats with them. I've been to the church many times, and 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 like any of those situations where you step into groups of people, certain people gravitate towards you and they and they feel connected to you. But I never express anything like Jimmy Shelstrom. I never say a thing about what I really think. If I did, if I did, they'd, they'd probably try to get me hauled away. But I really enjoy um, observing, you know, their their mixture, and, I, and it reminds me of, of Christ a lot. And that Jesus was traveling around after he left the carpentry job to James and all, and he started moving around. He gives you little clips about the things he was hanging out in, and, and I often ponder about what he thought, you know. But he obviously didn't say anything either. He was above it, you know, he, he was like, he was through it, you know, he was like, he was melted with it, you know. But but that reminds me, let's get back to this, because um, time flies. And, and the original question about the LSD thing is extraordinary, I think, in a sense, you know. And what, what happened, though, is like I said, my friends were all taking it. Wait a minute, let's, before you go into this, um, is this something uh, that could be public? Or at least within a circle of friends? Public? <laughs> yeah. What you said? Did you say public? Yeah, I did. Yeah, I don't. I don't know what would be if, if I took a shit. Maybe that wouldn't be too public. Huh? But other than that, should be fine. All right, go <laughs> on, go on. You're on. You're on. Uh, we'll see. But anyway, okay. Like I said, most of my friends were already taking it for about a year, and in eight nine months into it, I'm like, oh, well, okay. Uh-huh. And then I had some Hawaiian wood rose, and that kind of gave me a, a taste of the psychedelic field, you know. But anyway, our first my first trip was. Uh, um, uh, a sugar cube manufactured by some a kid over there at the University of Hawaii. And that was pretty good dose. It was my first trip, and so this guy and I shared it. was 1,500 mics, so we got 750 apiece, and that broke me in pretty good. So anyway, what I'm trying to get you to is what, what happened. So then that got me uh, sort of folding to the left. of The partying I was doing, after that, I started to fold in with guys that were more psychedelically oriented than the other guys that were just drinking, yeah? And, and we kind of gathered this little group together, about five of us that were all, like, big-time puffers and, and wanted to explore the LSD thing further, yeah? So we were dealing uh, pot, and uh, I'm trying to think of my... Okay, yeah, this is really cool, because the first trip... The Hawaiian Mudros got me broke in. The first trip was pretty radical, but also got me a little more comfortable with, like, oh, okay, I get it, yeah? Your mind tends to resist that stuff in the beginning a little bit, yeah? For some people, it takes a couple, three trips. Okay, so the third trip, I was living with these, this group I gathered with these five guys. We ended up moving out to Waimea Bay in a, together, and, and we were living uh, in a house, and we were dealing Can with... Can I uh, jump in there? Uh, we'll put a bookmark right there, five guys. Um, just kind of back up, like, how did you, you know... Uh, you were out of California and you went to Hawaii. What, you know, can you just say one or two things about that, how you got to Hawaii? And then we'll go back to the five guys. 
Oh, your parents moved My there. My parents moved to Hawaii, and I... Uh, and when was... How old were you when you moved to Hawaii? Oh, gosh. My parents moved there in September of uh, 6'5", and I had left home. I was 18, so I went off on my own gallivanting around, and my freedom was explored. I didn't decide to go to college, so that September was... Ah, uh, okay, I get it. So then eventually you kind of circled back in and... Uh... Ironically, I was with these four guys that were going to join the Marines, and I was one of the four. So we were headed back to uh, this guy's home, and I was going for the kicks of it because I'd never been back east, and they were going to think about going home first and then signing up for the Marines. So I went with them, and I went to the recruiter with them, and we all decided we were going to join the Marines together because the three, four of us were Newport pals in that summer after I graduated. And, and, and so uh, at the interview, I decided that the recruiter was lying, but they all didn't do that. So I said I'd sleep on it, and they all wanted to sign right there, and I said I'd sleep on it. And the next morning, they all went and signed up, and I said, no, I'm going to pass because I believed the recruiter was lying. And uh, ironically, I came back about two years later, and they told me, dude, I can't believe it, but that guy lied his ass off. <laughs> Nothing <laughs> he said was great. <laughs> And I, I think that was because of my dad. My dad was had spent a lifetime with people selling cars and stuff, and he got to really understand a lot about, you know, you get to understand about people, little tricks about how, why, how you can prove or not people are lying. You know? And liars tend to forget what they say, so they, they say a mixture of things while you're hanging out with them, and, you, and that helps. So there's a, a number of key things about it. But I, I believe that was it because... As I got older, I lost that technique, and my dad was really sharp on it. And he had a okay. self doubt about it. I'm gonna, it. I'm gonna steer the, I'm gonna steer the uh, stream here a little bit. Uh, so you know, you were there with those Marines, but eventually you somehow, you know, you're 18, and somehow you made Wait, it back. You, back you, 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 Hawaii. you made so it back, back to Hawaii. To, um, yeah. Uh, they all decided to jump in the Marines, and so I came back to California. Uh, one of their brothers was had never been to California, and so he and I alone hitchhiked back to California. Yeah? And when I got back to California, I, I, I worked for a railroad and a dam and hung out in, in, in the middle of the country for a while. And around Thanksgiving or so, we started, you know, this guy wanted to head to California, and I was sort of run out of what I was doing back there, so I said, I'll, I'll go with you. And we hitchhiked together solo back to California. And those guys signed up and jumped on the Marine boot camp thing. So when I got back in, in uh, California, I was always excited to see Mark and Matt and all that stuff, so... We did the whole holiday thing, and then Gloria was just meeting Larry. It was just connecting with Larry, right? So Gloria paid for my passage, and my family talked me into going home. My dad and my mom wanted me to come and stay with them in Hawaii. And Like I said, it was that first release of bring, I'm 18. Bring, bring, bring me to Hawaii quickly here. <laughs> yeah, we're getting there. All right, go ahead. <laughs> Sometimes you interrupted me. I was just ready to do exactly what you wanted me to oh, do. Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. Go on, man. There's no problem. Out of that arena, and you catch me and go, well, let's get out of this arena. But anyway, okay. So uh, so my my family talks me into to going to, back to my mom and dad, and my mom and dad are sort of like a renewed vision. And so anyway, bottom line is I went to Hawaii with Gloria. Gloria paid for it, took me and Tammy to Hawaii to meet Larry. Larry was just retiring from the military, and he was wow. getting out and. So um, anyway, yeah, that's anyway back to the thing about this. Yeah. So I lived with my parents for about a, about a month and a half, and said, "This is the pits." And, and I moved out. And and then when I moved out, I began to gravitate towards a group of people that were. Uh, after about six eight months, evolved into pot smoking uh, explorers, you know, LSD people. But the first people I hung out with more surfers and people I knew from Newport. But anyway, um, this group, like I said, I, I narrowed it down to four or five guys that were really tight buddies with us. And one of, one of these guys, his dad was a four-star general of the Pentagon, and we're dealing pot, and we're early in the game, yeah, and, we're, and we're dealing LSD, just starting to deal LSD. And I was, uh, had a, I had a, a reason for all this, because I had, I had read, I, I'm trying to figure out what I'm going to do about the draft. Everything's about this. Partly why I didn't take it for a year, because my main problem was, what am I going to do about the draft, yeah? And I didn't want to jump off and get all druggy, because I'm really trying to figure this problem out, Yeah. And so I read Siddhartha, and I read Bhagavad Gita, and I rehacked through the Bible. And at this point, I'm sort of dangling. It's like, fuck, I don't know what to do. None of these books have helped me. <laughs> and, um, and then the LSD thing comes up, and I thought, well, you know, maybe this will help me. So anyway, back to the start of the story. I meet these three or four guys, and we get, start dealing together and getting together. So we had a house in town, and we had a house in the country where we were going back and forth. 
two guys at a time were going to the city and dealing, and then two guys at a time were going out to Waimea. But the place at Waimea was connected to, the other half of the house was connected to these two people that knew Tim Leary, Barbara and Leonard. And they were dealing LSD direct, yeah? And they had direct contact with Osley. So they were buying Osley shit. So as soon as we moved in the house in Miami, we're connected to Osley's Sid, and we were just getting into selling acid more, way more regularly than just the pot, yeah? And there was a whole contingent of people coming over for that summer. They were the first time trying LSD, first time trying pot, because they left their hometown and graduated and were doing goofy things like people do when they get away from their hometown, yeah? Right. So it was a, it was a great momentum. Anyway, so my first trip was a, was a sugar cube, but my second trip was at that house with that situation. And uh, it was, a, was like a night kind of, we got the well, bring, whatever. I took a hit of Sid, Osley what, Sid. Okay, Osley Sid. Huh? What, what, what kind of uh, what kind of acid was it? I mean, was it a tablet or was it a? Oh, in those days it was uh, White Lightning, which was a four-way tab, twelve hundred mics. You what did the tab? What, what, what did the tab look like? A little baby tab wasn't much bigger than a sucralose. A little tiny, like, a little pill, a little tiny pill. Yeah, half the size of, one-third the size of a button on your phone, probably. Really tiny. And, uh-huh. the, and the four-way was pretty, it was it was difficult to cut it four ways, and the four, what was so fun is, uh, we would cut it four ways, and there was people we'd meet, we'd go, okay, uh, they gave us like a buck or whatever, and they go, a buck for this? And I go, take it and pay me the buck later. See what you think. <laughs> it was such a tiny fragment, dude, that they go, this is not going to do shit to me. Because <laughs> we're talking like, you know, I mean, like a booger, about the size of a booger. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it was um, it was all right. tab, yeah? Everyone well, gave, gave me the money within about 25 minutes. <laughs> but I had a number of people I handed that to, and they go, dude, this ain't going to do shit, dude. And I go, check it out, see what you think. But it was quality shit, dude. No, it was quality shit. It was so quality, it was unbelievable. Everybody we sold to was an instant customer, man. I'm not kidding. <laughs> okay, so... And, uh, so can you like, anyway, like okay. can so you have the bridge? Trip, this is all leading oh, up to well, the let me, question. Let me just kind of just throw one little pit of, bit of pit of direction is just, uh, you know, we're going from that and, and somehow, you know, we can move, merge into the original question was about, you know, the introduction of the UV and, and you can just like go from where you are right there. That's exactly what I was going to do. Well, okay, <laughs> I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a young director. Okay, give me some slack. Okay? Yeah, yeah. Well, once you once you hear the whole thing, you'll see why I'm. All right. Well, lineage. see, I'm, I'm kind of ignorant about how to direct stories, so. Yeah. Uh, you got anyway. Okay. Go on. Just for you. the second trip was the third trip because I had Hawaiian Woodrose. Okay, I don't know if you know why I'm telling you this. I'm telling you this because oh, it's like great. A it's arena great. Is a little... No, this is awesome, man. Just, just. Yeah, it's just yeah. stuff, and and for the most people that are serious thinkers, it takes a little while to get my, ready. You know, I my goal, what I get out of this is I want to, you know, this is, a, you know, like I said, an inaugural uh, podcast. But the other thing is, is uh, you know, one of my main trips these days is the Arantia book. So, you know, we go through all this stuff and kind of like go there and the UB and meditation. You could talk about that too, but just. There you go, man. So here we are. Where were we? We were in Hawaii, and man, some really trippy stuffs going on. And uh, well, like I said, third trip was a time for me in my evolution where it just hit me in a way to a new view of things. So my third trip was in Waimea, next door, with our first purchase was Osley, and this guy. Somehow I ended up in this room immediately with this guy in a in a room, empty room, dark with shadowy light from the sunset, me and him, four straight hours, and he talked the entire time about Buddhism. <laughs> and I was obviously interested because I, re- interested because I read Siddhartha, I read Gita, and I was just at a spot in my life where I'm going, what the motherfucker am I going to do about this goddamn draft, yeah? And I was very perplexed, you know. So anyway, I take this trip, and it's my first really good trip when I'm really ready for LSD, yeah? Mm. This guy talks nonstop for four hours. The whole thing was extraordinary. I don't know how it even happened. But anyway, next thing I know, I'm in this room with this guy in the dark. We can only barely just see each other's silhouette. And for four straight hours, he talks about Buddhism, everything about it. And this guy was a, really a, a master of the thing, you know. He's about, you know, ten years older than me. But anyway, the next morning, I went to buy LSD, some more LSD, and, and next door. And as I followed Kip, the guy that led me over there, 
I remember you. I remember you mentioning Kip. You know, I don't think I met him, but you've mentioned him so many uh, times. I tried to find him. I can't find him anywhere. It, what's funny about it, a lot of those guys I grew up with is none of them are on the internet. It kills me, man. But they're just those kind of guys that from that old era. But anyway, sure. okay. I'm following Kip. He says, "Come with me." So from our house next door to their house, he had to lead me through because obviously they're big LSD dealers, and they don't want anybody coming out without without an introduction, without a person that they trust. Yeah. And that turned out, Kip was the guy who used to go directly to Ozzy and pick it up. But Kip runs me around the corner after this trip the night before with this guy. So I was pretty psychedelicized, but also very in a thoughtful place because the whole rap on Buddhism was extraordinary to me. I'd never really penetrated it at all to that depth yeah, by, a, by a surfer guy, you know. That right. I was more familiar with that kind of people, right? Yeah. They really gave me a great view, yeah. Anyway, he indoctrinated me without even trying. Yeah. Anyway, as we come around the corner, on the kitchen table is a big old blue book. And I said, mm. what's that? And Kip looks behind me and goes, book from outer space. Boom. Around the corner we go, pick up the Osley, and off we go. So that was my introduction to the ranch book. <laughs> and I was uh, at 12 years old. I had a seventh grade teacher that, that went on this whole thing about how there's definitely civilizations on other planets, which I'd never heard before and knew no one that knew anything about it. But he was really an advocate of it. And I asked for a telescope for my birthday that year, and I got really into the stars, and I, and I told myself, I believe that on the other side of all this, there's civilizations, yeah? So that was blank in my mind, left dangling there. And when I saw this book, and he said, a book from outer space, I was hooked. I said, i got to have that book. i got to see it, because I have always had this seed in me germinating, what the hell's going on in outer space, yeah? <laughs> so that's how it all came together. That desire, that thing was in me, yeah? And when he, that was a perfect thing for him to say, is a book about our space, because it had me hooked, you know. And the way I really got introduced to the reading of it was, was actually a while later. I, 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 gra- I had borrowed that from them for a, a few moments one afternoon, but it was, it was a big, expensive book, then, and I gave it back. But when I ended up in prison, I finally had the money and the time. I asked uh, Lena, I, she, want, she wanted to know what I wanted, and I said, yeah, you can go down and pick up a couple books for me, three books. And one of them was E. Jing, and one of them was... Um, the 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 gospel according to Matthew by uh, Levi, a guy named Levi. Sure. And ranch. So she went to pick. Went to pick all wow. Three books up. Can, can we just? Can, can you give me a moment here? Like you know, can yeah. you like pull back just for a half a second because I'd really like to respond to to that. Um, you know that's amazing. Um, you know those uh, the books that you requested. Um, yeah. I mean, at that moment, and I think that, uh, you know, one thing that's, uh, you know, the ranch book to me is, man, I'm really into it these days, man. I mean, there's, I, there, I've been through a lot of cycles with it, you know, but it's always been good. And right now it's really good. And, uh, you know, I, I all, there's, um, I think a lot about prisoners around the world, you know, like, uh, it's pretty severe right now, man. There's like super overcrowding and people are like just out there. And I'm just thinking, what a great captive audience for the Shirancha book. <laughs> the interesting <laughs> you know? thing was, okay, as soon as I got to prison, there's six dorms. Now, yeah. five of the dorms are full of maniacs. And there's one dorm that's all Jehovah's Witnesses. So mm-hmm. I said, is there any rooms, any bunks available there? And they go, yeah, there's a couple, but you don't want to stay there. It's all JWs. I go, yeah, I do. JWs. <laughs> so I move into their dorm, and I start studying with the JWs. <laughs> Obviously, they consume you the minute you step in the door. Like, first of all, why are you here? And second of all, <laughs> want to be one with us. Yeah. And the other guy that joined me was this, this guitar teacher from, from uh, Eugene, Oregon. And he was a draft resistor, too, but he was a really extraordinary guitar teacher, you know. He's one of these guys that just, I mean, he started playing guitar when he was young, and he, and he became a teacher when he was, like, 19. I mean, he never had to really go through life, you know. But um, and he, was, and he, used to, he used to sit next to my bunk every day and do, like, three or four hours of uh, practice. And he was so good at practice, like marking the drums, he never got bored, you know. He was uh, incredible on the guitar. Nylon string, and just he could go for hours, and he never got bored, you know. But anyway, while I was immersed, in studying and living with the JWs, I was reading the Urantia book and the Gospel According to Jesus by Matthew, uh, by, by Levi. Levi, yeah. And the E. Jing, because I, because I had, when we were dealing Sid and living on, in Hawaii, a girl from Millbrook came and lived with us, and she taught us all about E. Jing and Zen microbiotics, yeah? And she had stories, because she was just living with Tim in fucking 
and and she came. She she found out about us dealing LSD on the North Shore, and she came and knocked on the door and goes, "Do you need a maid? I'll live here for free, and I'll and, I mean I'll live with you, and I'll cook all your meals, and I'll take care of you guys, and and, and in turn you give me a place to stay." We, we go right on. <laughs> Move on here. The turned out she was living with Tim at Millbrook. Well, Millbrook got woken up by um, what's his name that busted him? Uh, the uh, guy that Liddy. Liddy, yeah. Yeah, yeah. She, Gordon Liddy. He busted them. Everybody scattered. So she uh, said she got on a plane and get the hell out of there. It, 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 place, first place she thought it was Hawaii. It's far enough away. Nobody will know where I am because they were, <laughs> they were all scared, of course, because <laughs> Liddy was in a crew and just sure. scared the shit out of all of them. <laughs> sure, absolutely. But yeah, anyway, that, um, yeah. I later more about this. She lost her glasses somewhere after she arrived in Hawaii floating around, and she was so blind that her best situation was to live at somebody's house that was in a nice place and just hang out until she could afford another pair of glasses because wow. if she had her kitchen and her house in the, in the, the front yard, she could be fine, you know. And mm -hmm. her talent was cooking and, and creating food. So, But it was really great because she taught us the E Jing and, and told us the, the better parts of all of it. And, and she was in the Tibetan Book of the Dead and all these extraordinary things. And I was really at a, just a, a learning stage. And she was big on the diet. And so I learned all those those first seeds of transformation from my American growing life to that new embraced, resurrected life of LSD and better eating, better living, better thinking, you know? God, it's so fundamental. And yeah. that's, that's like the whole, you know, like people these days, they kind of like just the hippie trip, you know, but, you know, the real hippie trip, the one that I know about is, is that kind of stuff, you know, it's like it was, you know, you went from like the beat generation was like a breakaway from, you know, the old established ways, you know, that was good. You know, it was the first break, you know, where you're like a free thinker, you know, but then it had you to catch be... that email of mine. I just got that killer archive of Alan Watts. Oh yeah, sure. I, yeah, I responded. I, I've got that. Yeah. Right in front of me now. And uh, I haven't even got the chance to, but it's something I wanted to buy about it a year and a half ago. I had it on my Amazon wish list. And I kept, every time I look at it, I go, oh, I got 62 bucks, you know, uh -huh. but I finally had the money and I said, I got to have that thing. It's what is it out of, out, out of your mind, out of the mind, out of your, out of your mind. And it's, it's uh 12 discs and a little, and a little package, you know, with a little binder and, uh, and, and, and it's like six get discs package, six package discs with one on each side. So 12 discs, 14 well, hours of Alan Watts. And I imagine it covers the whole spectrum. The picture on the front is way back when he just left being a minister. And I remember that picture when he was real young. But that, going along with what you said, that whole thing about Jack Kerouac and, and Allen Ginsberg and Alan Watts was in our background, along with the Beatles. Those things kept coming in, in the places I was hanging out and growing up. And, and, uh, and my parents were pretty hip, although I don't know if they read any of those books, but they had friends that did. So it was, it was in my background. It was, it was knocking on my door, yeah. And I was familiar where, with it. Let's put it that way. Somewhat familiar with it, you know. Well, like, but, uh, how how would you rate the, uh, you know, this is not supposed to be a, really a ranch book uh, rap, but uh, how would you rate it, I mean, in terms of, uh, you know, authority about, uh, compared to everything else you've checked out? I mean, why is the ranch book, like, pretty, or is it core or, or what? <laughs> to me, has always been the symbol. I, you know, the first one I got had that symbol in the front, and that was, like, that was it. That was all I needed because of all the, what I had gone through on LSD and the transformation from being an American kid with a lot of doubts to being a person who really got started to get it, you know, and, um, it happened to me for, happened to me very, very fast considerably, you know, but I had a, an incredible environment that I hung out in. I mean, I was standing right behind Tim Leary a number of times in Laguna, you know, right next to him and stuff, you know, and this is in the peak of the days when he was like a god, you know. What I mean? He was like he was like the Beatles practically. Yeah. But anyway, um, so I, mean, I really was fortunate to be hanging out with all these people and be really early in the game to even have Osley Acid and all that stuff. So I was very I, hard to say. I mean, probably in the end, I'll get upstairs and my angel will go, "Well, we we took you through all that, <laughs> you know. I'm your guardian angel, and I wanted to make sure you got somewhere, so I took you through all that. I, I made sure all those things happened to you, but um." Because I, I, in a way, it, it, it seems like that because so many great things happened so so rapidly to me in a, in a succession of events that were extraordinary. But but they just gave me a good dose of reality, and then and then real life came in. And like when I moved here, the twenty years I did here before I retired, I, I didn't. Do here much here is like uh, it's like 
Oh, sorry. She's really busy doing the thing. I really wanted a wife or a chick, but you know the situation in America. Basically, well, remember now, this is this is for, this is something you know you you're sharing a lot of valuable things for people here. So we, you know, it's kind of. I just never could get it together with all that I needed to to make a, a more complete life. Like if I had if I had found a woman that was in my well, same wavelength, well, I could have shared that. I had more time of my on my own to do some of the things like that, like studying and reading the Rancher book and you know praying, meditation, all those kind well, of things. Okay. Because I did everything my I was pretty strung out in terms of I never had very rarely had weekends off, no vacations. I had no. I was in your own business becomes a, a a growth like too many kids or whatever. It pretty much takes over your life, you know. Right. Day and night working all the time and only small breaks in between and. Like I said, no weekends off, no no vacations. So hard to get away. All but right. Well, you know, I want to. You know, this overwhelmed, is overwhelmed. You know, this but is. Actually, I needed money so bad because I, I, up to that point, I, I never had a very comfortable way to even get money. And pretty soon, when I had my own business, it was the most comfortable <laughs> relationship I ever had with getting money. So I, didn't, I actually soared off into that exploration of like trying to get it together with my financial stuff, and I accomplished a lot of things I always wanted. You know, like I bought a new truck, and you know, and I had well, great places. It, Cetera, is, is is all this going to be appropriate for our podcast? I think so because I think okay, all of great. life is all right. That's think, great. That's great. That's great. That's great. I'll tell <laughs> ask people this one thing. This is your life. Yeah. The first absolutely. clap is for birth. The second right clap on. is for okay. Go and on. That's about man. as good as it gets because uh, this is a very very fast journey, and in a sense, everything I'm saying is a is a full bleed into reality. Yeah. Right. And, and maybe it doesn't happen that way for everybody, but in a way, just to hear what I have said, the evolution of what I've said, brings you closer to reality. And the reality is this life. Like that last tweet you called me on, before before that was an evolution of thought about the whole deal on where we're at and what's been given to us, yeah? And um, it, is, it is that heartbeat and breath. If the world crashes financially, which they're predicting, and everybody goes down for the count, it's all going to be that, heartbeat and breath. We're all connected in that one thing, and it's the most important thing. And when you spend time in that arena, like Zen teaches, you begin to realize what we are really about, and that is life, and that is of light, and that is love. We're here to take care of each other. We're here to explore the possibilities of life. Become expert at one thing so you have something to share with others, and have something to feel good about in yourself, yeah? And um, that's where we're headed in the future. I mean, I think our life above is going to be all about the things we love the most, the things we feel connected to in spirit the most, and, and it'll begin a journey of exploring those wholeheartedly, what your, your gift to the universe can and shall be, yeah? So this journey here is very quick, and we're inundated with a world that's very, very materialistic, and it's a very short time, too. I mean, we haven't been materialistic for that long, considering what you were talking about earlier, where it's a half a million years of, of the evolution of um, our societies and our civilization. Well, let's, um, let's, let's flip into this one. I mean, um, we were talking earlier about meditation and prayer. I mean, um, is there a distinction between those two things? They, one should spend a part of each day drinking the re the mir miraculous <laughs> or our beer however you, however you choose to do that's up to you of course but i think that as far as our ascended selves go we will all reach that level where we do spend a time removed from all that's around us to drink wholeheartedly a relationship with what we have here which is this moment of ex the ability to explore life itself yeah the, the very thing that you've been given, you know? Well, okay, and, Nick. Uh, let, Nick. The Dalai Lama does two hours. The okay. first thing, he gets up at 4 a.m., he does two hours of meditation, and he begins his day. That is, I think, okay. the ideal life and the life we all should do because it's the very life that is most worth, li worth living. You know? Whatever else we do, it's not as worthwhile as that. Because that, he spends each, a moment each day to go, this is it, this is it, this is it, you know? And then he steps forward from that and begins to explore, reads or teaches or speaks or travels, you know. But there's no doubt that's a beautiful thing for anyone. I bet a lot of varieties of people have done it. You know, Jack Schwartz did eight years in Indonesia, you know. And um, I bet a guy did seven years on San Clemente Island. And, uh, and I've met many people that did one year. And, then, of course, all the lamas have done three years, three months, and three days. 
But everyone you meet that does any of that stuff connects with that thing in life that, it, 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 that we as a planet are generally missing. We've done the, with the physical thing. We crawl out of the caves. We, we worship rocks. We've done all that. Now we've done the intellectual thing since about, what, 1200? We got the Magna Carta. We began to move into intellectual comprehension of our reality. And now we've evolved to this high point where we're looking at, you know, we're sending spaceships into space and we're looking at, through Hubble, we're looking at other galaxies. So now it's time to really embrace uh, that third element we, we have yet to, to massively explore, which is our mind, body, spirit. And so, like I say in one of my tweets, uh, if you really want it, just spirit. With a spirit, but that circle, getting back to what I said earlier, that <laughs> circle, the cover of the You Answer book was what hooked me right off the bat. And I already had realized to a certain extent how important that relationship with yourself and the universe is, is that uh, concentric circle of realization. It's, it's what, when you speak, when your heart beats, when you act, you are your own concentric circles emanating into the universe around you, your job, at your family. It's the moment you step out of bed, you begin a concentric circle of waves of who you are, right? Right. So the more up you are as an individual, the more that concentric circle of influence uh, affects the reality of your day, who you who you involve yourself with, and and I think that it, as you gain in wisdom, it, it, it begins to occur to you that a power punch of positive affirmations or a power punch of meditation before you begin your day colors your day that way uh, endlessly. And so I think as we evolve as a society, we'll, we'll, like a lot of the factories have Tai Chi when you get to work. You do Tai Chi for like 30 minutes and you go to work, yeah? So it's that experience of bringing something extraordinary and essenceful into your life first and then stepping into life to blend the rest of your day that is becoming more and more uh, realized, I think, as a way of life. Yeah, yeah I think to- I think that, that you know, that counterbalances um you know, there's a lot of negative thinkers out there who would like to say, oh, well, yeah. the world. That's exactly I mean, it. especially the last you know, 20 years. I spent a lot of you know, time well, a lot, a lot of people say, you know, they, they like to focus in on the problems. They like to focus in on, you know, the world's yeah. crumbling, the financial system's crumbling, uh, you know, uh, America is stupid. Uh, you know, yeah. China, I mean, most people China, are, you know, well, the thing is most people well, are not. Well, let me go on with this. With a, with a real uh, positive uh, uh, attitude. Most right. people I've met, well, hold on a second. what proof do you have of eternal life? But, right. but I think you and I are in that mining right. field of realizing that right. everything about our lives is showing us that this 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 thing is a jewel. Life itself is a jewel. And we're, we're just getting ready to get started on it. When we leave here, we'll be our real embrace of life, yeah? That's true. This is just a, a visit, you know? Short well, visit. I, I think the point I wanted to make is just that, you know... Um, you know, even though the world can be, uh, you know, a hostile place, um, you know, for like spiritual ideas and spiritual concepts, um, you know, a lot of people kind of cower uh, in the face of, you know, stupidity. You know, if you have great spiritual beliefs, you know, it's hard to share those sometimes when you're up against, you know, uh, mundanity, let's say. But um, one thing I was thinking is, uh, you know, listening to you is that, you know, and it's something I've, I see all the time is that, you know, small efforts are being made, you know, and the patience of like, uh, you know, we were talking about the ranch book and uh, of uh, the revelators or, uh, you know, any kind of higher agencies that, you know, the notion of the time that they operate in is... Um, it's a different space. So, you know, things, people need to cool out. That's all. That would be my suggestion is like, you know, take it easy, you know, like uh, tune into it and uh, just work with what you got. If you want to elevate yourself to a higher level, you know, that you can do that. You know, if you want to live the man- mundane life, you know, go to work, uh, raise your family, do all that. That's cool too, you know, but if you feel some kind of pulling inside of yourself to know something more about yourself, then you can do some inner work. And uh, inner work is, uh, for me, it's the best game in town. You know, you were talking about your psychedelic history and, uh, you know, association with your ranch book and stuff. And these are all like, you know, if, you, if we really were to condense it all, it's a, it's a quest for, for truth and for knowledge and for truth and beauty and goodness. You know, it's like 
it's like, you know, that's pretty interesting. You know, why would we be, uh, you know, for people like that are true atheists, you know, they talk about, well, if you're an atheist, you really have to believe in a mechanistic uh, universe. But, you know, really, where do these kind of values come from? You know, science doesn't talk about values and uh, meanings. You know, those are outside of the realm of science. Science doesn't have anything to do with meanings. Yeah. You know, they have to do with yeah. facts, you know. So anyhow, right. uh, it's thanks, a, it's a thanks. World too. You, you could go on. Um, yeah, that was just some input so you can uh, think about it. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, I, I, and I was going to say, too, I, I probably might have said this to you before, but my the tweets I've done in my favorites is everything that I've learned. And it's sort of an archive, in a way, of everything that I've figured out or that I've contemplated or that I've, that I've settled upon. And so it's just there. So I put that out. So it's, you know, that. And I, because I don't really know where I stand. I mean, I, I could conk before the next year because of this number of reasons. But on the other hand, I, I sort of see it that way. I mean, everything I'm doing, renting this office and all these things are sort of a, of a, of a, of a throw of the dice of like, if I, if I do continue on, then this is, then I got to do this. But if well, I don't, have, I've, I've have done kinda, this so far. Wait a, minute, wait a minute, though. Wait a minute. Hold on. You have to live kind of in the here and now. I mean, all of us are subject to uh, sudden death, let's say. Yeah, yeah. Well, plus, my dad died next year. So, you know, and I have a lot of his nervous system and a lot of... I, I often felt that we're both speeding so fast that that's why we end up dying young, because we've, I've been well, speeding okay. since the day well, I was this, born. This, this, this brings up a, a, a old question I like to ask myself, which is like, you know, if I knew I was going to die tomorrow, let's say, I mean, really, I mean, let's say, you know, somebody, yeah. some, I got a message. Hold on now. I got a whole, a, a really clear message that's, yeah, tomorrow uh, evening at six o'clock, you're going to die. And then, <laughs> and then, so, so the question to myself would be, okay, oh, well, what do I, what do I do now? I mean, you know, how would yeah. I live my life differently knowing that than if I didn't know that? Right, right. I mean, what's the difference? Some people would go, like, if they had a year, you know, that's the old game, you know. Oh, you have a year to yeah. live. They'd go, oh, I'd travel the world. I'd do this. I'd do that. But yeah. I'm talking about I'm talking about less than that. Let's say tomorrow, you know. And for it's, me. It's about where you are. But no. I, mean, I don't have wife and a kids. But if I had wife and a kids, I'd spend no, 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 it. If, no, no, no. if I only had 14 no, hours no. to go, I think I'd spend it with them. No, no. But in my sure. case, I don't have that. So sure. I, I have other ideas, yeah. you know. Okay. No, you're. You're kind of following where I want to go with this. It's just that, you know, it for me ideally it shouldn't really be too far away from where what I do, anyway. Yeah. You no. Know, oh, in other words, if oh, tomorrow I'm going to die, well, then I shouldn't really. There shouldn't be like I should be going. Well, I sh I should already be doing that, you know, in the here and now because that's. You know, I, there shouldn't be any change. If I, if it, somebody told me definitively tomorrow or an hour oh. from now I was going to die, oh. what would it would oh. mean? It would just be like uh, nothing. Oh boy. Okay, I'm sorry, but I, I got myself in a real bind here. Uh, I have to hold, put you down just for a second and take care of business. Sorry. Sure. <laughs> oh gosh. Oh darn it. Oh, unbelievable. Uh, oh. Okay. Uh. Okay, I'm, I'm sort of in a quandary here, but it takes me about 30 seconds, but it's raining, I have a $500 machine outside, and I've got to put something on top of it right now. Do it. And I tried to open an umbrella, but I got it all screwed up. So anyway, I'll Do be it. back in about 10 seconds here. Sure. Okay. Oh, man, gosh. Okay. <laughs> Are you back? <laughs> Hello? Hello? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you okay? I, I bought a new phone, and every time I go to switch from speakerphone to regular, I do my old method, which doesn't work on this phone. So just when I grabbed it, <laughs> you were gone. <laughs> okay, well, I'm sure everybody wants to know... Um... Uh, how how that all went? <laughs> oh, oh you know, it was just complicated. I have one arm, and I need an umbrella. And umbrellas are a two arm show. And uh, and I have a 
it's this time of year where I got to, April 20th is when I got to lower my yard because it gets about five feet tall with foxtails and all this crap. So I hired this guy yesterday to do it, and we, we decided to leave the machine out because I didn't know it was going to rain today. So all of a sudden we're talking, I'm looking out there going, oh, shit, this poor machine's going to rain on. <laughs> it's an expensive machine, so not a good idea. <clears throat> so anyway, the whole dance of doing it was difficult, but I got it done. I have down on and down got all wet. <laughs> But anyway, mm. I knew that when I was, and there's no way I could get this down jacket off quick enough with my arms. <laughs> I had to deal with it all, is all. <laughs> but it okay, so we're cool it now, huh? Yeah, yeah, we're cool, man. And I pushed the wrong button. I was already done when I reached for the phone. <laughs> I wanted to connect with you, and I pushed the wrong button, so that was the well, end of that. Well, you know, that was, um, you really shared some incredible, you know, history. Um <sighs> And I think, you know, what kind of what it's led up for you is you're, uh, you know, you're doing the, the tweets and now getting into this meditation. Uh, yeah. You know, is, is that I'd like to share it with the public. That's what my, my, my wish is, is to share it. And I, I think that, you know, like we were talking, we, we, you and I, I'm, every once in a while I get back to thinking about small parts and, and our lives hanging out with people. And in our private lives, Dennis and you and myself would talk a lot about this sort of drift, you know, about the possibility of exploring a, a spiritual relationship to one degree or another, at least a more enhanced view of life, you know. As I've been mean, talking about meditation <clears throat> earlier, I think everyone can benefit from, whether it's 10% of your day or once a week or whatever, it's a highly beneficial to, to kick back a little bit and, and drink the the fact that you what you have you know the the re or the essence of what is going on here you know in in your friends or in your life or in yourself you know and I think that's what meditation really is in a way is is that you spend part of your day to uh, applaud at the same time that you spend a part of your day to to applaud your physical reality and your mental reality and then we also need to uh, participate and applaud our spiritual reality. And I think it's dawning on the races of, of the planet, you know. I think there may be, um, you know, there may be some people that might shun uh, this kind of, you know, what I would call inner work or meditation, uh, you know, because, uh, you know, this there, there's a kind of a, a new generation that really embraces atheism, you know, basically that science is, is all there there is and, you know, such nonsense as sitting there and meditating is is, is uh, kind of uh, you know time better spent playing a video game or something <laughs> or a computer game. Every time I hear somebody say they're an atheist, I go, you know, God's an atheist. <laughs> that always gets them for a loop. I have a mastery. I'm a master of saying things that completely level people. <laughs> but since they don't believe in God, they don't take it too too seriously. But I think that. If you were God, why would you need to believe in God? Since the reality of God is is absolute, possession right. of all right. structure as far as we can perceive. <laughs> right. Why would you need to believe in yourself? You are reality. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. But, and that, and that, that the beautiful thing is, is sort of getting back to that all in all thing. When I was in prison, in this same dance we were talking about earlier, where I was reading the answer book alongside of the the Jehovah's Witness version of the Bible. And alongside of Levi, was an automatic writer who, who got these, you know, revelations at four in the morning and would automatically write these. This, and I was really interested to see what he said about Jesus Christ versus what your answer book was saying about, you know, Jesus Christ. I was getting introduced to both of them at the same time. And, and it was easy, as you might imagine, I, I relatively quickly put all the other ones aside and said, this, this your answer book is detailed and for the, to the money yeah, about their description of this guy, yeah? Yeah. And also universal in its approach, whereas all the other things are limited in many ways and um, and sort of very finite. But anyway, um, you know, I forget what I was leading to. Yeah, that's, that's all right. Yeah, I, I think, um, yeah, it's really interesting to hear the, the history behind it. I, I guess I could point out that, you know, it's like I'm part of the legacy. I mean, I uh, uh, I can say very, you know, it, it's we're doing a lot of reminiscing here, which might be good for the record. Uh, might be entertaining to somebody. I know I'm entertained well, I by. Thought yours, your situation was extraordinary in that I think you were like 13 and you decided to go see Chuck, participate in that, uh, uh, the beginning of that uh, Calvary Church. Oh, yeah. Remember you told me 
Yeah. Uh, going to hang out there. Yeah. And um, I mean, the beautiful thing about us is that I think I innately we're, we're, we're very independent. Matt and Mark and you and Tammy and myself all have a uh, we all have a kind of unique connection. It's like this is interesting too. Going back to what you were just a little bit about what you were connecting with a minute ago. But this thing about the world we're in. But anyway, most people, for instance, if I'm in a factory working or if I'm with a bunch of people, if you if you just stop at the lunch table and say, you know, sort of like, what do you think about God? Well, most people just haven't got much to say because it isn't their exploratory, you know? Right. And I think also they, they have no idea who they are or what they're here to do, you know? Right. Uh, the, the, not even that specifically, but more the, the imprint on their soul that really makes them feel fulfilled is lacking I would say, in eight out of ten people's lives, wherever we are in America, or, or the Western world, for that matter. And it's not their fault, of course. Well, I, I, would li- I, I would like to throw one thing out, is that we were in a uh, oh. a hot spot. You know, we were in a place, you know, Southern California was pretty, you know, I mean, Tim Leary talked about it, you know, it's just about human evolution, you know, how it just always moves from east to west, you know. We're right yeah. there on the, we're right there on the cusp. I mean, that's why California is just, you know, evolutionary, you know, in, in terms of intelligence and, uh, that kind of evolution, you know, the humans on the west coast of California, I mean, it's, it's right there. I mean, of, of course, you know, you could say a lot about that. Well, then there's Asia on the other side and it all connects and stuff. Yeah. But, you know, if you really look at the evolutionary stuff, I mean, you look at like, you know, Lucas films, you look at, uh, you know, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, you look at Boeing, I mean, you just look at, uh, you know, all these kind of like innovations like Silicon Valley, the computer, I mean, all of that stuff, man, it's all there on the West Coast. You know, check it out. Yeah, yeah, and, and it was, it's really true. I mean, there was a lyric in a song in those days in the, in the latter part of the 60s that was, uh, where California is today, the rest will be tomorrow. And, and mm. so there was that much, I mean, I mean, right. musicians are a, are, are a, a a psychological sieve of a society that they're in. So well, they, they're just saying that as a reflection of what was actually going on around us. But it, well, it I'm gonna, I'm gonna, moment, yeah. yeah, I'm gonna jump in though. It's like, yeah, um, uh, the uh, the ranch book. My introduction to it was uh, through you. You know, as part of that legacy. I mean, it just it happened. It was very interesting how it happened too. You know, Tribuco Canyon. I, Trib- I remember you were steamed up by. You just walked away from Calvary because in the process of experiencing them, you decided that it wasn't all for you. And you were really ripe. Because you asked me really a rapid set of questions almost immediately within about a week period or two-week period that were very much to the point about certain things, you know. And that's what I think, you know, gathered esteem. Like each one of the answers I gave was like, whoa, i got to check this out. So within what, one or two weeks, you went and bought the book, you know. Oh yeah. So that was very interesting, and that you were so ripe, and especially at that age. I mean, how off the wall that you were like fourteen. Yeah? But you were there. I mean, that's the whole point I'm trying to make is that you were in your own personal self, your adjuster or whatever was was on its way already, and then this came along. You know. Well, it's interesting because you know that kind of almost raises hairs on my arms to hear that because uh, I don't re- really remember. You know, I mean, I remember. What I remember is, um, you know, I remember hearing you talk, you know, in a circumstance that, you know, we could talk about in some other uh, podcasts, let's say, but uh, basically it was some things you were saying that were directly out of the ranch book that just really appealed to me. And uh, I do remember the Cavalry Church, um, you know, scene and all of that. And, uh, it's funny because I wasn't, you know, I wasn't brought up religious, you know, and, um, uh, I, I'm, I'm very, th- I'm very thankful for my, uh, curiosity and inquisitiveness into these things because I've, in, in my life, I've found them to be the, of the highest value of any trip you could talk about. I mean, some people like to talk about sports or the weather or, you know, this yeah. hobby or that hobby, but, Man, the God down into one little small. But the, the the you know the God trip is like fuck, man. That's like you know, let's get into it. You know, I think a lot of atheists are lazy. I think they're. I think I think really super intelligent atheists are like on the cusp of something great. You know, like Einsteinian and and Carl Sagan and all that. You know, those guys are like you know they were they didn't really say they believed in God per se, but they were like 
when you start getting so far out, you know, with intelligence, you're going to have to come up against something that's like beyond science, you know, so you're going to have to deal with that shit, you know, <laughs> and uh, I don't know, it's so, really, I, I think it's a lot about the organic situation we're in. And organic means living, and, and, and what it is is like I've met a number of PhDs who are so com- – or like the people I've met that have read the Urantia book for years. They're the first ones to say there's not a, a word in there about meditation. They've read the book religiously for 10, 15 years. That's so not quite true. Around, but it's not a word wait in there a, about meditation. Wait, wait a minute, though. That's not quite true. I mean, I think the – I've, I've had this happen to me. Well, I'm just saying – but no, wait a minute. But, but are you saying that in the Urantia book they don't mention anything about meditation? No, I'm saying that I've – what I'm trying to say is that people get so hooked up on material reality, they can't see anything else. Well, uh, sure. I met, I, oh, I that's met a guy, sure. for instance, at that's Fort Bragg. For sure. For sure. At Fort Bragg has been running a Sriracha book study group for over a decade, and I came in and joined the group. I had employees in it a lot of spare time, so I, I found out about them and ran down there and you know got involved with them. And... Um, and he said to me, to my face, he, he, uh, for one thing, it's, it's this great clash of egos like you used to find in the locker room or in high school. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The thing about meditation, he started getting on this trip about demeaning me in front of the group. You know? Well, I, okay, I, you know, that's just, I just silly. I think, but... but that, yeah, people play that game. But, but I, that, I just, um, that leads I just me, said, hmm. the thing about meditation I had to say, and he said, there's not a thing in that book about meditation. I said, oh. <laughs> but the well, computer will tell you there's... Five pages of references to meditation. Well, I, I, I think that's what I was bringing up about, you know, the difference, you know, definitionally um, between meditation and prayer. And I think me knowing you as well as I do, I, I think the distinction is very little. But I, I that's what I was trying to say earlier is that I think the distinction for uh, your average Joe modern day uh, type uh, that goes to these, let's like I said, a strip mall yoga center, is that meditation is one thing and prayer is a whole other thing. But for you and I, it, it seems like there's, you know, there's a lot of crossover there. But for most people, and, and, and you know, what I was saying is, you know, I'm into the ranch book. I don't like, you know, at my age and uh, knowing what I know a lifespan is, fuck it, man. I'm just going to say the UB's got what it's got to say about, you know, what prayer is, you know, about the evolution of prayer. You know, prayer is, is an old thing. You know, I was reading an interesting thing in the ranch book tonight. It was about how even, like, it doesn't matter who the fuck you are or what your beliefs are. If you're in a fucking dire situation, you're going to pull out a prayer. <laughs> you could be an atheist. You could be an atheist motherfucker. But you're going to go, holy shit, help! <laughs> society, you know, really do. I see that a lot in people who are about the third year into their child. They start to argue a lot about how to raise this child. Next thing you know, they're practically slamming each other around, and they end up going to church for hope to find Sunday school involvement, other people involvement. They want to. They're searching for some way to to, to yeah. unify no, their it's relationship. No, true, man. It's so gonna... much where I was growing up and where I lived in the city. Sure. And stuff. Well, they, they were not into it before, but they had to reach out in that level because it is a very socializing uh, uh, affair to yeah. immerse yourself in, in somewhat of an experience in church. It's a difficult affair raising kids for, for many people. They, they get oh, into yeah. a lot of different battles about how to raise the kid, and, and it brings out things they didn't expect because they didn't have a kid in their relationship before. Yeah. But anyway, it's all very interesting, and, 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 I, and I see it. Like, you know, because of the things we, we read and the very music we listened to even years ago, we're instructed about synthesis and, and, and brotherhood. But other people, it's really quite simple. I mean, everything is really, really simple. You know, And that's the, one of my quotes I got out of Fortune Cookie is, is the, the profound <laughs> life includes uh, uh, the reality of simplicity, and that's really true. The, the more you go into clarity, the more you sit. You know, if you sit and do nothing but just sit, in 20 minutes, 15, 20 minutes, a certain clarity begins to arrive, arise. And like the Tao talks about, that the mud uh, starts to settle, you know. And yeah. so this is true for anyone. That's why I believe they should have it in school, without any religious connotations or any kind of game playing. They should have one hour of sitting in every student classroom in the world, yeah? And that would begin this process of a natural, our natural being that exists, that we're living at such a high pace we don't even know. I mean, the average person can knock on the door and go, you know what, life's a miracle. And they'll just sit there and go, like, uh, I heard that. I mean, they're just so out of touch with themselves, you know? Like one of my tweets is, the greatest miracle 
All, for all of you who have never seen a miracle, you are the greatest miracle on the face of the earth, and you have missed no, noticing that, yeah? But it's so true when you meditate. When you meditate enough, you begin to orientate with your farting and your reality of self, yeah? Those two things begin to relax in you, and you start to really look at yourself and go, wow, I'm something here. I mean, this, this thing I've been given, the ability to stand up and get a glass of water, what is more extraordinary than that? <laughs> the fact that I can, I can read something and then translate into knowledge and gain from it and share it with others, what is more extraordinary than that? Computers are great, scientists are great, but hey, get back to the, the body-mind incredible machine you got. Nothing. Yeah. No, that's anywhere that. near. And I think that mm. just meditation <clears throat> itself can steer you to a greater appreciation of that, you know. But the, the battle is, and a very interesting one too, is like Julie and I talk, most of the people that she goes to Zen with are very unhappy. They're great Zen meditators, but they, they're depressed, and they're not electric like we were about, you know, enthusiastic sort of response to, to LSD, to living, to being, to hiking, to, to drinking nature personally. We have all that, we had all that electricity in us automatically, and, and much to the chagrin of a lot of our peers is that, you know, you spend too much time doing nothing, and you got to get busy and do something. <laughs> but I think it's, it's, like I said earlier, it's about, you, me, Mark, and Matt, and ironically, isn't it extraordinary that that time existed? You used to get out of school when we were out of work at McGregor's, and we had that time to, to interchange some stuff while I was hanging out with Mark and Matt, and you were hanging out, yeah? And that's when that question and answering came right when I got out of prison. That period of time was available to us that, that we encountered each other before dinner, you know? And so, you know, you know, I have to say in a way that all these things were, it was like almost like we were guided, you know, by some inner inner thing, you know, that had a, a more of a dominance of us than it does most people. None of us have ever been hooked on money. I mean, we, we would like to have it. We think it's, it's very interesting to people that have money, but we're not after it, yeah? We're not, it's not our soul quest. It's not our affirmation, you know? We always, all five of us kids, all six of us, we've all been, Chris is the contrary to the rule. He's atheistic, Chris is, Oliver. Uh-huh. And he's, uh, he's the one who's got the PhD, you know, he's, he's in that bracket of, um, not quite getting it, although he grew up with us and he was influenced by us. And, and well, and Steph- I think, well, I think Stephanie had, yeah. I haven't told you this, I probably haven't heard, but Stephanie embraced and started reading the ranch book about a year and a half ago. Oh, that's cool. Ah, it's really cool. She, she caught me at one of the Christmas gatherings and said, Hey, tell me something about the Urantia book. And I gave her about a 20 minute rush. Like I do, you know, <laughs> talking like a waterfall. <laughs> Went out and got herself one and started reading it. And then she wrote me a few emails and goes, Oh man, this, so cool. <laughs> really? That's neat, man. Put that in there. How about that's your two sisters? It. Ever embrace it? No, not really. You know, my yeah. uh my younger sister, uh she's really she's really into the uh the Christian thing, you know, into the church and stuff. And she'd oh, probably be she'd probably be open to it. The other one is uh not inquisitive enough, you know, too too involved with the family, raising her three boys and I doubt that. Well, you know, Rick, Rick Bowling was, was really enthusiastic about it. Oh, when he was Rick? on a roll about it. He would, he would, oh, he would Rick, would, Rick would have got it totally. I mean, he, you know. He used, he, he used to read it, and then he'd get on spurts and go out in the streets and drink and talk all about it. I mean, he had an incredible mind for absorbing. Oh, he would yeah. have a, No, Rick would have on, man. Hours, it's on, man. Absorption, that experience would influence him for like two days sometimes or three days. It was all he would talk about. It would be an experience he had. Uh-huh. Maybe it was drugs, maybe it was music, or maybe it was your ranch book. But whenever he dipped into something, he was like amplified in his response to his dipping, yeah? yeah. That's sort of his life. I mean, at least I got to see a bunch of him frequently in a concentrated form because we lived together for about, what, about eight months there or something, yeah? Yeah. I really got to see his, his yin-yang rubber band of his whole show. And, and forgive it, and I was meditating at the time, and I, and, I, I, and I went through some of his trials with him and some of his negatives, you know, but... I could understand, I mean, again, it came to a more understanding of what he was composed of. And I, and I understand why he threw himself in front of cars. I mean, he was just in a battle with himself, you know, he really was. And, and it, but, it, but it was beautiful stuff, and his beautiful stuff part, he was incredible. He was really incredible. Like I said, he would, he would drink something for a couple hours, and for two or three days, he'd be on that. He'd be like, dude, have you heard about this? <laughs> or have you experienced this yet? You know? <laughs> Wow, that's really cool. I guess if cool. been more balanced, I, I could see him being a preacher or something. He was very enthusiastic about oh, um, yeah. uh, different aspects of life's electricity, maybe music, maybe philosophy. But right. it was always about, at least in my experience, it was always about, as he, after he left home, 
I think in my experience, it was only about essences. Essences of situations that influenced him the most, you know? yeah. And maybe because he knew in, in somewhere in himself that he was going to die. But he got a lot out of a little, let's put it that way. No, that's for sure. No, Rick was... Um... You know, he was a, he was actually when we were growing up, you know, he's an intense little fellow. You know, I could tell you a lot of stories about him, but, uh, you know, I think yeah, he, yeah. uh, and you actually, you know, I lived with you guys. I was there for a while. I was trucking, but I had a, I had that loft in there and, uh, That's right. you came in and out. You were out a lot and in a little. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. But I was there, man. I mean, Kat was there and, uh. Yeah. Well, I always remember that. And I think it was all beautiful because I had reached a stage where I had, you know, more or less died many times already. I realized my own deaths, and so everything he was going through, I was good with. Well, and I was also trying to help him, you know, and and in the end, it was just over. But I think okay, that, well, look, um, you know, that was uh, we're going to try to make a uh, some kind of podcast out of this. I don't know, you know, who this would appeal to. Would it appeal to your ranch book readers? Would it appeal to? Uh, my psychedelic friends or a both or none or anyhow. So what I'd like to do is uh, if, if you have any closing comments uh, about this inaugural uh, Dow Lodge podcast, uh, we'll just like, you know, you can have a closing comment and, uh, and then you and I can continue uh, privately off the recorder. So you have any, so in this podcast, okay, this is pretty cool. We talked about a lot of stuff. Your, your, uh, you know, your history. You're, you're related to me because you taught me on a lot of good stuff uh, when I was young, and yeah. uh, I think it was a good exploration of a little bit of your past. And it, your ranch book is a big focus of it. Psychedelic drugs are a big focus of it. Uh, blah blah blah. So I'm going to leave the last uh, whatever you can have uh, as long as you want to rattle on. Go on. Uh, well, I would say up to like 10 minutes or so so or it's only 20 yeah. seconds whatever so what do you what do you have to say this is the podcast that you close it's it say, it's the one that i keep near me but keep the mouth shut and the senses expand open the mouth always be busy and lose everything <laughs> is that is that what we need there that's the end that's, all that's right the thing to, all right i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna kick uh, man okay I'm, I'm going to be right back with you. I'm just going to kill the recording. And that's our, sh our, uh, the oh, Dow Lodge podcast, 2011, uh, April 28th. Thank you. Anyone. And so you're lucky to have it. But thirdly, second and thirdly, is that other people hear these things and do begin to understand. You never, like Jesus said, let those that have ears to hear, let them hear. He, he knew exactly what, what we're talking about here. And this podcast idea, there's people out there that will catch the drift, you know. And you can't, um, it's hard to find people like you and I found each other in terms of being really connected and very similar vein of a, of a, of a grasp of how it is. Well, but, not that rare. You know, I, I'm on this uh, Urantia group on uh, Facebook, and it's pretty vast. Well, you are too. I mean, there's over. I see it there. I haven't tapped into it much. There's but, over um, 500 people there, man. There's a fucking scene going on. It's the hottest. Uh, Ooh, yeah. r most r it's interesting. I'll tell you one thing, and then I, I really do need to go to get something to eat. Yeah. Um, because it's like I haven't had dinner. It's almost midnight. Anyhow. Um, yeah. Uh, on this group, when I first got on it, there were a lot of these uh, people that were doing these channelings that were using like kind of your oh, ranch, yeah. like your rancher book terms, like Monjorison and stuff. And and I mean, even as bold to say, you know, I am. Christ Michael and, and like direct raps, you know, and I'm just going, fuck, man, I've, I've been praying for 40 years and I haven't heard like, you know, you know, hey, Russ, you know, I mean, I'm, I, well, actually I have, but I mean, basically, I'm, I'm here not, for you, kid. you know, I'm not getting <laughs> know, like, I'm not getting are... like paragraphs and, and fucking pages of shit coming down that I could like quote for, for you through my thought gesture, but these people are spewing it out like it's like, you know, like they're script writers or something. And, and anyhow, they well, I'll were, tell you the truth. Well, wait a minute. I'm not finished. Started. Wait a minute. Hold are on. Your now. Book are oh, are your ranch book study group? Hold on, be... man. I'm not finished with this story yet. You have to... Yeah, I know. I only had a short sentence to add on to what you're saying. Oh, okay. Go ahead. The, the ranch book study group we had began to be dominated by these people and their babble. And I, I discovered personally that, you know, that's all bullshit. <laughs> it, it's, it's real to them, but it's, uh, Reflection of people who are a little bit out to lunch in a material world, you know. 
So it's Babel from that edge of the world. Yeah, yeah. That's true. But there's all these people that were into that stuff so heavily are people that are dodging the issue of finding yourself. I can tell you that much. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, and, um, that's true. Yeah, and it just so happens that you, Mark, Matt, me, Tammy, we're all self-reflective to a certain degree. And that is the very wherewithal that gives us the connection to this kind of thing. So that it, is beyond it, words and beyond experience, you know. So so Tammy's a, a big Urantia book reader, huh? She's not a reader, but she's right there with every bit of it. And, and, and she really, really appreciates, you know, things, she has four kids, and that's a, Four kids, a husband, she's a housewife, so that's a very involved universe that has very little time. Like you said earlier about five minutes reflection, even that, she loves to talk about it. The ideas about it are real to her, but the five minutes is difficult to come by. <laughs> and, and and I can totally relate to that. Like I said, I mean, Tammy's kind of fun in that sense that I can relate to that part of the world that's very, very wound up, you know. But um, but at the same time, she embraces wholeheartedly everything I say, and that's the difference. As you, you'll talk to people about the same kind of thing, and they'll really reject it, you know. But Tammy and Matt and Stephanie and, you know, Mark, when you sit down with them long enough, they totally go right on, dude. I totally feel that. I totally believe that. I'm totally there with you, yeah. And so clearly, it's not about the book, and it's not about the, the drift. It's about who you are, yeah. Well, dude, listen, we're, we're going to continue this Um I'm going nice to the... hear from you, man. I was w wondering how you're doing, so I'm glad to hear that things are rolling along smoothly again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, everything's very good. Very, you're surfing very... freely. You're surfing freely. Surfing freely. Well, what That's I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, um, kind of edit up this uh, our little podcast this evening, and let's see how it goes. Let's do another one. If it... I'm into this. I'm big time into this. Um, yeah, it's and... a good idea. Yeah, yeah, and I'm trying out some of the technology. But yeah, I'm going to do this, Nick, so... Um, uh, yeah, dude, it was great to hear from you. Totally, and, um, totally. And, um, is this a well, good like you time? said, if you see is me this... twitting, you probably know I'm awake. <laughs> and sometimes it's 4 in the morning, and sometimes it's 6 a.m. or whatever, but the thing is, that's a great way for us to know electronically. Well, I, I, can, I can ping you, you know. I have to say, hey, you you, you on it? I'll send out an email. If you get, if I yeah, yeah but it's no big deck. deal. And, yeah. uh, anyway, I'll let you go. I know you got things to do. So I'll catch you next time on the on the on the wave that comes next. Okay. Well, um, you know, uh, I, I heard an interesting thing. This guy, what's his name? Uh, I'm gonna. You see my tweet that says "World Exclusive: What God Really Looks Like." <laughs> I may have missed that one. Uh, I'm, I'm <laughs> oh, I love that else. shit, man! My, I just my, have my to get shift. It's a star. It's a star. Like a world exclusive, what oh, God really Trump. looks like, and as a picture of a star. <laughs> Russell Brand, uh, uh, I don't know if you ever heard of this guy. He's a British comedian, Russell Brand. For, for very, I've heard of him. Yeah. Anyhow, yeah. he he had mentioned he's into God, which blows a lot of people away because he's quite intellectual. Yeah. And uh, but he said, you know, he, what did he say? An interesting thing. It was um, um, oh, oh, it was something about a dog, a dog recognizing his master in any clothes, and it had to do with like. You know, kind of like the world's religions, you know, like no matter what religion you believe in, you know, it's all the same God, you know, God, you know, the dog always recognizes God, no matter what clothes, you know, God is God. Anyhow, I'll leave you with that, Nick. I'm going to bail. So uh, we'll connect again. I'm, I'm going to send you an email that's a, that I've been looking for this the whole time we've been talking at the end here. So I'm going to send you an email and check it out. It's a tweet that I did a, a while back. that's really interesting about the last things we were talking about. Do it. And, and I'll catch you later. All right, bro. Okay, bye. Okay, bye-bye. Okay.